Hi, welcome back. In these next few sessions, I'd like to focus on growth investing as an investment philosophy. While growth investing doesn't come with the pedigree that value investing does in terms of background and empirical evidence you know, showing that, that it works, it does have adherence, people who believe that this is the way to beat markets. And in the next few sessions, I'd like to open that door to see if, in fact, it is possible to beat the market, to deliver returns above market returns using growth investing as your philosophy. So again, let's start with the definition of who a growth investor is. The conventional, the lazy definition of a growth investor is to classify anybody who buys low PE stocks or invests in a particular sector, technology for instance, over the last three decades, is automatically classified as a growth investor. That is, I think, a dangerous definition because generically there's no reason why growth investors have to be in just technology companies or buy high PE stocks. So I'm going to give you a variant on that definition which is going to harken back to the way I thought about value investing and it goes back to that financial balance sheet. Essentially a growth investor is an investor who buys a company for its growth assets. Remember how we characterize growth assets. These are investments you expect a company to make in the future, and you're attaching value to those investments even though you don't see them. Growth investors believe that their competitive advantage arises from the fact that they can assess the value of these growth assets better than the rest of the market can. So if you look at the at a traditional financial balance sheet, growth investors focus in on growth assets, and that's where they go looking for for value. So it's not that growth investors don't care about value. They care about the value of growth assets more than the value of assets in place. So what this effectively also means that if you're a growth investor, you're going to be roaming in different parts of the market than a value investor will. Rather than be stuck in the portion of the market that contains mature, often declining or declining companies, you're going to be in the portion of the market where there's tremendous growth potential and you're trying to find companies which are being undervalued by the market because the market's not quite getting their growth potential. So with that definition in place, let me lay out the four phases of growth investing that I'd like to look at over the next few sessions. I'm going to start off with a strand of growth investing that's not always growth investing. That's investing in small cap companies. The reason I say it's not always growth investing is while many small companies are growth companies, you can also be a small company and be a value company. So you can have small cap value investing, but I'm going to focus on small cap investing generally and talk about a str the subset of small cap investing that's small cap growth investing. Then I want to talk about investing in companies just as they go public. Presumably companies go public because they have tremendous growth potential and they cannot capitalize that growth potential being private businesses. So I'm going to argue that investing in IPOs is in fact a type of growth investing. We look at the upside of IPO investing, the downside, the pluses and the minuses. The third strand of investing is very similar to what we talked about with value investing, which is you create screens that find cheap growth companies. Not cheap value companies, but cheap growth companies. So the kinds of screens you will use here will be companies that are growth companies where the market is paying too low a price for that growth. And the final phase of growth investing I want to look at is activist growth investing, which is you invest in young growth companies before they become recognized as young growth companies and hope to make money as they become recognized. So this, in fact, is the nature of venture capital investing or, or some aspects of private equity investing. So those are the four aspects of growth investing I'd like to focus on in the next few sessions. So let's start in this session, at least, on small cap investing. It is one of the most widely used investing strategies out there. And you could actually argue that since many small companies are growth companies, that it's a strand of growth investing. And there's substantial empirical evidence backing up the proposition that small cap companies do in fact earn higher returns than expected. And the expected has to be taken with a grain of salt because it's got to be based on some kind of risk and return model. But small cap stocks look like they deliver higher returns than large cap stocks of equivalent risk, at least using conventional risk measures. Here's the, here's the way I can back it up. This is actually the return. These, these are the returns on small cap versus large cap stocks. So companies classified by market capitalization from small companies to largest companies, all U.S. stocks. And it looks at returns that you'd have made over a very long time period. Now, before you start getting too focused on the two columns, here are the two the ways in which the returns were computed. The first, 
you first created, you broke the stocks down based on market capitalization into 10 classes, and then you, then you invest an equal amount in each stock within each portfolio. That's an equally weighted portfolio. The other is a value-weighted portfolio, where you weighted the companies within each portfolio by the market value. So you think, what do I read into this? The equally weighted portfolio returns are much more, much higher for the smallest companies than the value-weighted returns. And what I would read into that is it's the smallest of the small companies that are delivering the small cap premium, not the largest of the small companies. So when we talk about a small cap premium, we're really talking about companies with really small capitalization, not 1 billion, but more like 10 million, 20 million, 50 million. The smallest of the small cap companies are, seem to be the ones where you get this big premium. So let's take a deeper look at the small cap premium. Let's start by looking at how it's varied across time. Again, if you look at, th at this graph, there are two lines. The red line is the premium for the smallest decile companies. Those are the 10th the, the decile, the, the smallest companies versus the market. So the red line is the smallest companies versus the market. The blue line is the smallest companies versus the other end of the distribution, the largest companies. Now the two lines kind of move in the same, the same direction, which makes sense. But there are a couple of interesting things. One is the difference between small cap and large cap stocks obviously is much more exaggerated than small cap stocks versus the market. That's to be expected. So it's not as it's so the way to read that is there's not just a small cap effect where small cap companies earn more than the market. There's a large cap effect where large cap companies earn less than they should, less than the market. But notice also the swings across time. There are extended periods for small cap stocks earn less returns than the market and large cap stocks. Anytime the line falls below the axis, you essentially have not just a smaller small cap premium, you have a negative small cap premium. Small cap stocks earn less than other stocks. So I decided to take a closer look by breaking down the returns over a very long period from 19, going all, all the way back to 1929, no, 20, and going all the way through 2000 broken down by sub periods and if you start breaking down by sub periods and the way to read this graph is I've reported large cap mid cap small cap micro cap stocks okay so there's clearly a small cap if you look at this the first time period there is no small cap effect large cap companies actually had less negative returns than and the reason the returns are negative is you got the Great Depression right there in the middle but large cap stocks earn the premium then you get to the 1952 through 57 time period and you see that small caps are now or, or micro cap companies and small cap companies earn higher returns than large cap companies. Then you go back to a down period, large cap companies earn lower negative returns. So in fact, now you've got a large cap premium. Back to a small cap premium, back to a large cap premium, back to a small cap premium, back to a large cap premium. So you can see that the premium swings around. In fact, if you look at just the 1990s, the first half of the 1990s, 1990 to 94, there's a small cap premium. Small cap stocks earn much more than large cap stocks. In the second half of that same decade, 94 through 98, large cap stocks did better than small cap stocks. So when people say there's a small cap premium, it's true. If I take the average across the entire time period, as you saw in the previous table, small cap stocks have earned a premium of about 3, 3.5, 4% three over large cap stocks over the market. But that premium is a very volatile number. In any given decade, decade, 10-year period, the reverse could have happened. So there, there are, in fact, some who argue that the small cap premium, especially if you looked over time, has kind of dissipated or disappeared. In fact, Jeremy Siegel in one of his books argues that if you take out the 1970s, which is a very good decade for small cap stocks, that much of the small cap premium disappears. So there's actually an argument to be made that what you've observed as a small cap premium might be an accident because you looked at the 1926 or 2010 12, that there is an accident, that over time that this premium could also disappear. I don't think it's that extreme. I think there is a small cap premium. I think it's volatile over time. But here's the other thing to remember about the small cap premium, and we mentioned this in our discussion of price patterns. Much of the small cap premium is earned in January. So if you miss the first 15 days of the year, you might as well not invest in small cap stocks because that's when the bulk of the premium gets earned. 
So the small cap premium clearly exists on paper over a very long time period, but it's also a premium that varies across time. And that then leads us to possible explanations. If there is in fact a small cap premium over very long time periods, how do you explain it? Here's the simplest explanation. You have transactions costs, trading costs in small cap stocks, much larger costs, which explains why you need much higher returns to cover these costs. In fact, the flip side of this argument is if you decide to go and make your living investing in small cap stocks, those transactions costs are going to eat away at your returns and what you're going to deliver as actual returns is going to be much lower than what the returns look like on paper. And in fact, that seems to be true if you look at one of the best known small stock funds, the DFA small stock fund, which is actually an index fund of small stocks. It, it was created out of the, the financial findings or the empirical findings that small cap stocks are under premium. That fund, which is a well-regarded fund, has underperformed the paper returns by 1%, 1.5%, 2% per period, reflecting away, again the bite of trading costs and transactions costs when you adapt. Uh, when you adopt a small cap stock strategy. So the first potential explanation for the small cap premium might be it's just a premium that the market is giving you because you have higher transactions costs. That doesn't mean you cannot make money on small cap stocks, all right? Because that transaction cost is a one-time cost. So the longer your time horizon, then the greater the chance you can actually earn a high return because you can spread. You can amortize those transactions costs across time. The second potential explanation for the small cap premium is it's not an excess return, it's just a premium you're earning for the higher risk you face when you invest in small cap stocks. And for this argument to hold, you've got to also show that this risk will not show up in your conventional risk metric. So for instance, if you're using beta as your measure for expected return, the argument would then go that the beta doesn't capture the kinds of risk you face in small cap stocks, that the true risk you face when you invest in a small cap company is therefore higher than what you see in the beta. And there are a couple of costs that you can, uh, or risks that you can think of that are related to the size of the company. One is an information risk. Small cap companies tend to be less followed than large cap companies. There are few analysts, there's less information. So you might know less about these companies than you do large cap companies. And because of that, you might feel they're more risky. The second is there might be other kinds of risk, liquidity risk that we're not capturing in to the beta. And that could also push up the risk in these companies and therefore the returns you should make should compensate for that risk. So if in fact it's fairly easy to show that the analyst coverage, the information you have on small cap companies is far less than on large cap companies. And a simple way to show this in fact is to look at the number of analysts tracking companies by market cap size. And if you look at the, the smallest companies, they tend to be followed by relatively few analysts. They tend to be held by relatively few institutions and one's connected to the other. The reason analysts follow companies is because institutions are interested in them. But collectively, there's less information being collected by on small cap companies, which potentially should also open you up to more risk. The flip side, though, to the counter to this argument, though, is that might be true for individual small stocks. What if you create a portfolio of small companies? There should be some averaging out of risk. In fact, in a portfolio of small companies, even though you might know very little about each company, there's an argument that those risks can average out. The caveat I would offer is in many of these companies, what you don't know is what managers are not telling you about these companies. And you could argue that what they're not telling you is more likely to be bad news than good news. In which case, the averaging is not always going to work out because you're more exposed to bad news than good news with small companies, which means you, ne you need a much higher return to compensate for those negative shocks. So let's say you decide to become a small cap investor. What is it you need to succeed? The first is all of the lessons about diversification and discipline become even more critical not less so because you're a small cap investor. If you're a small cap investor, the last thing you want to do is buy the five cheapest small cap companies. You probably want to buy 50, whereas as a value investor, you might have been able to get away with 20. So you have to be more diversified and more disciplined because it's so easy to get burned on a small cap stock. Second, when investing in small cap stocks, you have to take on the responsibility of collecting the information in these companies. You have to do the due diligence. You can't assume that somebody else will dig up the bad news for you. So you might have to go to places you normally don't go to. So the value, invest, the value investing, you might never look at a financial statement. You might just look at the multiples and some surface information. 
with a small company you have to do the due diligence and third you got to have it long time horizon without that long term time horizon to protect you you're going to be much more exposed to the kinds of risk with small companies and the other so there are a couple of reasons one is of course that you lower your transactions cost we talked about that the other is re recognize that there are extended periods where small cap companies don't earn more than large cap companies you got to be able to ride those periods out so in summary, we laid the table for growth investing in this session. We talked about the four different ways of doing growth investing. And in this particular session, we focused on the first of those four ways, investing in small cap companies. At the, and the, the, back, the backing for that is over a very long time period, small cap companies have clearly earned a premium over large cap companies. The dangers to watch out for, much higher transactions costs, and perhaps risks that are not captured in conventional risk measures but if you have a long time horizon and you're willing to do your own homework, there's no reason why small cap stocks shouldn't work for you. Thank you very much for listening.